Hello again and welcome. We left off here last time at a major moment in American history, Woodrow Wilson's famous 14-point speech, where he laid out his 14 points, his recipe for a peaceful world going forward after uh, the bloodshed of World War One, and the country was, or the world was still involved in that conflict at that time. So uh, on the right, we saw the quote uh, from G.J. Meyer, which talks about Wilson's uh, tendency to see the United States as this uh, in important uh, uh, exception in the world, uh, and uh, uh, and having a a a, a need, uh, having a duty. Uh, to in, involve itself in the war to bring world peace. So as odd as it sounds, uh, he's saying we have to fight this bloody war uh, to end war uh, as we as we know it uh, in, in the future. So as uh, the slide says, Wilsonian idealism, th this is dripping uh, with idealism. Uh, and uh, you could say, and plenty have, self-righteousness and arrogance on Wilson's part, and to the degree that Americans bought into this uh, on Americans' part. Though, remember that just because Wilson has changed his mind doesn't mean all Americans have changed their mind. Certainly, some had by this time. Plenty of Americans, if not totally supportive of war at this point, were at least getting closer to it because of provocations uh, from Germany of the type we've already talked about. Nonetheless, uh, the Wilson administration wasn't going to leave anything to chance, didn't leave anything to chance, uh, and uh, uh, started a massive uh, public relations blitz, ma massive propaganda blitz, which centered around the new Committee on Public Information, or CPI, headed by a noted journalist named George Creel, you see pictured here. So this is a, a, a monstrous pop propaganda machine. Uh, uh, Creel uh, said, uh, designed to fan the anger of an aroused people. So uh, this uh, agency uh, uh, had a huge role in convincing the American people uh, to go to war and zealously at that, uh, and it appears to have had uh, a quite a tremendous effect and impact. Uh, so, the techniques that they used to convince Americans uh, would go on to, after the war in the 1920s, to be sort of the founding principles and ideas in advertising and public relations in the private sector, in the corporate and business world. So, that many of the leaders... Uh, like Edward Bernays, who we see on the screen here, we'll I'll quote him in a moment, became the leaders uh, uh, of the uh, PR industry on Madison Avenue in New York City, centered there in the 1920s uh, and beyond. And the techniques they used here to convince Americans to support this war, fight in the war, do their part in the war, whatever that part may be, were the same techniques they later used to sell cereal and uh, cars and uh, whatever else. So uh, what happens here uh, with regard to propaganda and public relations uh, has a big impact uh, on American society going forward. It's one of the ways, there are many others, but one of the ways, just so I can point out uh, a couple of them, uh, that we said at the beginning uh, of the lecture uh, of the unit, uh, that uh, World War I changed American society and had lasting influence on it. Uh, this is a, a great example of it. So CPI was a federal government agency. So this was a, a government agency at the national level tasked with publicizing, quote, the absolute justice about America's cause and arouse ardor and enthusiasm. Uh, and that's uh, straight from the mouth of President Roosevelt, uh, President Wilson himself, Roosevelt. Uh, so, modern advertising techniques uh, that uh, included uh, a great deal of uh, modern psychological principles uh, and uh, an increasing understanding of modern psychology from the field of psychology. So, they're in a sense manipulating uh, Americans uh, from a psychological perspective uh, to get them to support the war. Uh, 
and CPI enlisted writers, teachers, filmmakers, psychologists, cartoonists, advertising gurus, uh, and more uh, to sway American public opinion. And they had all kinds of, uh, of advertisements uh, and newspapers, uh, editorials and newspapers, speakers that went out all over the, uh, the, the country. Uh, so just flooded uh, the country with advertising, propaganda, or PR. Edward Bernays, uh, one of its uh, main figures, again, goes on to be a, uh, a huge influence in the public relations industry, sometimes considered the father of public relations, said, Ours must be a leadership democracy administered by the intelligent minority who know how to regiment and guide the masses. It has been found possible so to mold the mind of the masses. It's a somewhat ominous statement and uh, an elitist statement saying the intelligent few or minority have to manipulate and guide the masses because they're too dumb uh, to do it themselves and you know for the for their own good for our society's good you know, sometimes uh, it's necessary to uh, mold them uh, and sort of control them uh, from above through propaganda again it was largely successful in taking Americans who had been ambivalent about the war uh, to uh, turning them into ardent uh, patriotic supporters of the war and being you know, idea idealistically, ideologically committed to it. And we start to see all kinds of, uh, cam uh, not campaign, but all kinds of uh, ads as part of this uh, PR campaign, uh, some of them subtle, some of them not so subtle. The, the ones on the left and right uh, are... Uh, portraying German soldiers as literally monsters here. Uh, so uh, that's not too subtle. But propaganda when it comes to wartime has always included villainizing the enemy, turning it into a you know, good guy uh, and a good versus evil struggle. So uh, this isn't surprising. That part of it's not anything uh, particularly innovative. Uh, but some of the other techniques uh, are innovative here. Uh, appealing to Americans' sense of patriotism, uh, making them feel guilty if they don't pitch in through buying liberty bonds here, conserving uh, on food. Uh, we'll get into that a little more as we as we go on. But uh, it's these types of things uh, and uh, far more that start the process uh, in the Wilson administration uh, of converting Americans from apathy uh, at worst, uh, ambivalence uh, to gung-ho support. So turning that uh, ambivalence uh, into this type of support uh, included uh, 75,000 of what were called four-minute men, people who went around uh, cities and towns and sort of just like propped themselves up on a soapbox, like Times Square in New York, wherever else where there's a crowd of people, uh, and made these short, uh, ultra-patriotic speeches uh, uh, to convince Americans. Uh, all kinds of, again, we saw posters, uh, political cartoons, news articles. Sometimes editorials were written in newspapers uh, with some sort of fake name at the bottom of it, like a letter to the editor uh, saying, you know, signed, you know, you know, Joe Smith. Uh, and it would say things like, you know, any American who doesn't support this war is unpatriotic and un-American and they should be ashamed of themselves. They should be uh, shipped out of the country, etc. And Americans that read that would you know, not know that that wasn't even a real person. That was written by CPI and planted basically in the New York Times or you know Washington Post or whatever it may be. And some strange ideas indeed uh, came along with this. And the point I'm making here is that when you push this hard to manipulate the public into supporting a war or you know, a national project uh, through uh, you know, strong doses of, of, of patriotism and guilting them into it and uh, you know, getting them to be ideological, uh, fully committed supporters of the cause, it has, uh, there's a case that can be made for something good that can come out of that or at least something necessary that can come out of it but it usually has uh, at least, uh, you know, one or more uh, negative repercussions, uh, unforeseen uh, 
uh, you know, conclusions, uh, unintended consequences, as historians uh, usually phrase it. Patriotic murder, uh, a phrase that, that came up more than once. Certain law professors, I'm not even saying the majority of them, but there were a handful when murders took place, uh, vigilante groups taking the law into their own hands. For instance, one, uh, I think a young man of uh, German ancestry, but it was born here, not not, not somebody from Germany. Uh, his parents or grandparents had been from Germany, but because he had a German last name, small town in Indiana, somewhere in the Midwest, and he was murdered uh, by a group uh, of people who suspected, you know, that he was a spy or something unpatriotic, disloyal to America because of his German last name. It's those it's those kind of events, however few and far between, that some law professors and other uh, Americans and uh, you know leaders said, well, you know, they, they were they, okay, they went too far, but they were trying to be patriotic. Uh, and in fact, in a, you know, in a wartime situation, the the court systems uh, uh, right sort of get bogged down, and so vigilante justice uh, can be kind of justified because they're handling cases that the courts might not get around to, might not have time to it, and they usually get the right person. Uh, you know, if they think somebody's a spy, they're probably right, uh, which is uh, uh, should be horrifying uh, to all of us since that's not the way. Uh, a justice system is supposed to work. That is not justice. Uh, if you're letting people that aren't trained in the law, they're not officials uh, of the courts of the law, uh, make decisions, and you think and you're saying, "Well, I think they they get it right some of the time, most of the time." Liberty cabbage is another good example of some of the irrational outcomes, uh, however unintended here. So, uh, uh, liberty cabbage. Uh, right is a a name that got substituted for the German name of a popular American food, not just in German American communities, but throughout the country. Sauerkraut, uh, and so why would they rename it Liberty Cabbage? It was an official, but there was actually a pretty big push, and most Americans complied with referring to this as Liberty Cabbage for the duration of the war, uh, uh, and that's because it was seen as as silly as it sounds, unpatriotic to. Uh, still call it by its German name. Uh, well, we have to call it by something American. Uh, and American, uh, you know, the word liberty uh, is a big, a very American word. At least we've adopted it uh, as such. So liberty cabbage. If you think that's, uh, uh, you know, something only of bygone eras, think again. Uh, in the uh, Iraq war, at one point, the United States uh, asked permission of the French government, who have always been an ally of ours, but they weren't. The French weren't wild about supporting that war, even though they were our ally. Uh, um, the U.S. government asked permission at one point of the French to fly uh, planes over their airspace on their way to Iraq or to the Middle East, uh, and the French government uh, declined and said, "No, you can't." And, and it's actually a big deal uh, to fly over someone else's airspace, so. It might sound strange, but th that's a big deal. So the Americans didn't. They, they flew around and went, went another route. But there was a great deal of anger uh, in Congress uh, about this. Uh, and the Congress actually passed a bill that I don't know how long it lasted, but for a time uh, renamed in the uh, Congressional Cafe on Capitol Hill, maybe a few other places too, I don't know, but renamed French fries on the menu uh, and uh, re-listed uh, uh, them as freedom fries. So, liberty, uh, cab liberty cabbage, freedom fries. So, that happened in like 2003, 2004. So, this kind of uh, irrationality that can sometimes uh, come out of a war effort, or particularly the, uh, the attempt to manipulate public opinion, uh, is pretty consistent over time. But this was such a large blitz of propaganda and a, you know, a hard sale, hardcore, as well as subtle pitch to Americans to uh, be supportive of the war. Uh, 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 maybe a lot more of this stuff came out than even usual. A good example of the more hardcore approach uh, is uh, the the absolute uh, obliteration, uh, in many ways, of American civil liberties during the war, uh, meaning our normal rights under the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, were 
uh, curtailed uh, in, in many ways, uh, attacked in many ways, at least temporarily during the war. Uh, but so much so that it does raise questions about the legality uh, of what the Wilson administration was doing. Uh, and there are plenty of historians that have commented uh, on this, including the one I'm quoting here. Uh, but uh, as a more specific example of this, there was a campaign for 100% Americanism and a campaign against hyphenated Americans. Both phrases, by the way, were used by President Wilson uh, in speeches and some of his advisors and uh, cabinet members. So these were phrases that were uh, you used kind of throughout American society, but also came from the very top. So uh, Wilson actually used these words sometime. Uh, so what did... Um, I'll read from Stephen Knott. I quoted him in the last unit as well uh, in his great new book, uh, The Lost Soul of the American Presidency, in talking about Wilson himself as president, said that Wilson's record on civil liberties was one of the worst in the nation's history. And I would agree. Wilson either encouraged or remained silent while his Justice Department ran roughshod over the rights of dissenting minorities. Uh... He said that certain domestic opposition must absolutely be crushed. So the authorities were pretty brutal uh, in suppressing basically any kind of opposition to the war, which means even if you said, hey, I don't, I don't agree that we should be involved in this war, I'm critical of this or that, they, they might come down hard on you, uh, sometimes with the full force of the law, as, as we'll see. Uh, when it says... Run, ran roughshod over the rights of dissenting minorities. They mean uh, minority in the sense that the 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 fraction of the population that uh, went to the extreme of openly opposing the war. Because remember, most Americans were swayed by this propaganda blitz, CPI, uh, their techniques. So it was it was a minority of citizens uh, that was uh, uh, you know openly critical. But they're the ones now who are under uh, threat uh, uh, from government uh, you know, reaction. Uh, so, uh, not goes on to say dissenters, meaning those who opposed the war, were routinely arrested, harassed, or deported, in some cases for simply speaking out against American involvement in the conflict. Uh, Wilson himself uh, talked about uh, men uh, as communities are supreme over men as individuals. Uh, and this is another uh, example of uh, how this uh, war kind of overlaps with uh, progressivism, progressive thinking. Remember that the progressives uh, believed that the United States needed to think more collectively and less about individual liberty and freedom. And that's exactly what Wilson is saying needs to be done here. It's not about your freedom to speak or to publish something you want to in a newspaper. It's about the uh, the, the, the needs of the whole uh, collective society. And progressives, not surprisingly, uh, did, uh, you know, support some of these policies, at least when they had, you know, these kind of progressive uh, elements uh, and values, uh, you know, uh, contained in them. Oh, what about the hyphenated Americans? Oh, I didn't even get to 100% Americanism. Excuse me. So, what does that even mean? Why, why does that sound ominous? It doesn't, I think, at first glance to most people. But if you think about it a little further, and we will, 100% Americanism, what's the point of even saying that? Uh, who, who's 100% American? Who's not? What are the criteria? Who gets to decide? Uh, right? Uh, and when you start asking those kind of questions, then it starts to sound frightening, right? Uh, think if the phrase were 100% communism, 100% Nazism. Uh, so uh, what if uh, you're a American and you like sauerkraut, a German dish? Does that reduce you to 98% American? If I drive an Audi like I do, does that reduce me now to 75% American uh, or lower? So, uh, what is 100% American? Especially in a country of immigrants and their descendants, as it already was at the time, uh, th that's a particularly scary phrase. And when the president himself is using it, uh, it's clear there's a pressure on everybody to conform, to conform with uh, a policy and you know, the government uh, uh, 
the, the, the war effort by the government, the military, but also to whatever is considered to be uh, American, even if you have to f try to guess what that's supposed to mean. Uh, the campaign for 100% Americanism was done alongside, uh, prosecuted alongside, a campaign against hyphenated Americans. What does that mean? Well, hyphenated Americans, of course, is uh, like African Americans today, Asian Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, etc. And so what is the president uh, and the government saying? Uh, what they're saying, and this is where we can see really how harsh this is uh, and how much it violates uh, you know, basic principles of American freedom and the Constitution, that Wilson and company are saying, no, no, no. It's no longer acceptable uh, to call yourself an Asian American, uh, a Mexican American. Uh, pick one. You're either one or the other. You're either American uh, or you're Asian, uh, right? You're either Hispanic uh, or you're American. Uh, uh, pick one. So, uh, right today we commonly accept uh, uh, that kind of hyphenated identity, uh, but uh, they weren't having it. At least, uh, uh, you know, officially uh, starting at the top uh, during World War One. So, 100% uh, Americanism, hyphenated Americans are a great example of how extreme the uh, push uh, and the uh, coercion of Americans uh, to support uh, the, the war effort, in this case, out of, you know, but, but using f tactics of fear. If you don't, if you're not 100% American, whatever that means, uh, you have reason to, uh, uh, ex you know, expect us to come down on you uh, hard. And they often did. We can see this through organizations like the American Protective League, which wasn't even a government agency. Uh, and there were other organizations like this too. This is the most famous one. But these busybodies, uh, officious uh, activists, was a, was a private organization that sent intelligence and information, uh, not always accurate, maybe sometimes it was, uh, about the activities, they're like spying and doing surveillance about suspicious Americans uh, who uh, might be of, you know, German background, uh, but who one way or the other uh, seem to be disloyal, not supportive of the war effort. And so this group that's not even officially, uh, it's not a government agency, is sending information. And more amazingly, the Wilson administration actually started to read these things and follow up on them. Uh, so these aren't elected officials, not even appointed officials. They're just Americans that have gotten together in this group to kind of say, "Here's we're doing our part for uh, about patriotism and loyalty by watching, you know, uh, everybody else, uh, spying on everybody else, and then issuing reports to the government." There were uh, other violations of civil liberties. Uh, one of the most well-known is uh, that perpetrated uh, by Albert Burleson, the Postmaster General in the Wilson administration. Postmaster General doesn't sound like you know, a position that would have much power, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, he did. Uh, G.J. Meyer uh, says to single out, uh, what he was doing was to single out for destruction any publications of which it did not approve, uh, or the government was doing that uh, through uh, the uh, Postmaster General, who you see pictured here. He kept all publications criticizing the war in any way out of the mail, which actually forced dozens of magazines to shut down. They lost all their, you know, uh, all their customers because uh, they weren't allowed to be put in the mail. Borson just kept them from the mail, which itself is a violation of the Constitution. First Amendment rights, freedom of, uh, of the press. He's not allowing freedom of the press uh, for uh, to, to, to suppress publications that he or the government believed uh, that might cause people to uh, you know, do something less than fully support the war. Some of these were socialist magazines that may have, you know, legitimately come under some suspicion uh, about how loyal they were to the war effort. But if you look at the whole list, some of them were just basic magazines, and it's hard to uh, it's hard to understand how they could possibly have seen be seen as uh, objectionable by the government.
to take this to kind of its fullest extreme in 1917, just as America was starting to get involved in the war and preparing to be militarily active in the war, send troops uh, across the Atlantic. Uh, the Congress passed, President Wilson signed into law the Espionage Act. The name is somewhat misleading. Espionage is kind of another word for spying. Uh, and there might have been a provision for that in there. But the main actionable uh, part of the Espionage Act was, was something uh, quite quite different. Professor Rourke, uh, our uh, lovable uh, author of our textbook, said the Wilson administration's zeal in suppressing dissent contrasted sharply with its war aims of defending democracy, which uh, is, an, uh, 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 I think, a, a worthy uh, and big contradiction for Professor Rourke to point out here. The United States uh, was supposedly defending and promoting democracy in Europe and the world. Wilson said as much. I mean, he said it openly and consistently. Uh, and yet they're not necessarily practicing democracy by suppressing freedom of speech, freedom of the press, cracking down on anybody who happens to disagree with them and criticize the war. The, the main actionable feature of the Espionage Act made it a federal crime to say or write anything that could cause uh, a young man of uh, draft age, there was a draft in this war, uh, uh, selective service, to not sign up for the draft. Uh, which, and the way it was worded, and the way I said it, both show that this was a sort of a loophole you could drive a truck through. And it was clearly, I think, deliberately worded that way, so it would give a great deal of latitude to the government, uh, to the courts, uh, to law enforcement officials to crack down on just about anyone who criticized the war. Because if you s said something as simple as in a speech or in a, uh, a newspaper article, magazine uh, essay that you wrote that was published, if you just said, I, I don't think this is a America's war, this is a European war, we should stay out. Well, couldn't that, couldn't it be argued that that might cause a young man not to sign up for the draft? Yeah, it could be argued. Uh, and sure enough, there were dozens of prosecutions uh, under the, this act. So yet another way uh, that the government found to intimidate uh, and silence American dissent. Some of this was clearly meant to frighten Americans. It wouldn't take that many convictions uh, for other Americans to get the hint and say, you know what, I don't want to go to, I don't want to go to prison and jail. I'm going to, I was going to publish this. I was going to make a speech, a public speech, you know, against the war. I think I'll delay that for now. So uh, this was the desired effect. There were some famous cases uh, uh, about the Espionage Act. Uh, this one, uh, the United States first Charles Schenck. Schenck was a not very well-known socialist who published something that got him uh, uh, uh indicted uh, under the Espionage Act and eventually sent to prison. The 1919 uh, 19 date there is the date when the court decision was finally made, which is after the war, but his actions that landed him in jail, that caused the Supreme Court to eventually make a decision uh, on what he had done, happened during the war. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., often considered one of the great uh, uh, Supreme Court justices in American history wrote the majority opinion of the court, uh, which said that uh, the government's uh, prosecution and conviction of Shank was proper, uh, and so they did. The Supreme Court didn't overturn it; they upheld uh, his conviction uh, and his uh, jail term. Uh, Holmes uh, used uh, in this uh, uh, phraseology in his written opinion that's become famous. Uh, one phrase that he used was famous, uh, and an analogy that he used uh, became famous. The analogy uh, was, uh, it's not a legitimate use of free speech uh, to falsely shout fire in a crowded theater, which could cause a panic and someone to be trampled to death. Uh, you know, you could say, oh, I was just exercising my freedom of speech. He's saying you can't do that if you're causing, uh, you know, a possible mortal danger by, by doing so. And, of course, the analogy was meant to uh, uh, to say that that's kind of what's happening uh, when someone like Schenck writes an article criticizing the American war effort. You're putting Americans in danger. Uh, 
how it was putting them in danger was, I think, a little uh, or, or much less clear. Uh, but that was the, the, the reasoning that Holmes uh, used, at least in part, uh, to uphold the conviction of Shank. He also talked uh, about kind of a test that should be used. Uh, that said that, uh, yeah, you have the right to freedom of speech, of course, an American citizen under the First Amendment uh, and freedom of the press, uh, but not if your speech or your published words pose a clear and present danger to American society. Uh, and, of course, Holmes uh, is saying, the justice that wrote this opinion, uh, that uh, what Shank and others uh, have done by criticizing the war effort uh, is pose a clear and present danger. Again, exactly how was left a little bit more vague. Another famous case uh, over the Espionage Act uh, was uh, one involving someone we already know, uh, and I know well, Eugene V. Debs. Remember, Debs has already gone to prison once for his role in the Pullman boycott, his you know, huge role in the Pullman boycott uh, after there was a federal injunction making the strike basically illegal. When Debs continued the strike for several days afterwards, he was in violation of federal law and went to prison because of it. Here he goes to prison for a second time under the Espionage Act, and he, he seems to have wanted to go to jail. There was something of the martyr in Debs, uh, liked being kind of a martyr for a cause. So um, the day that uh, the speech that he made in public, he was already famous, of course. Uh, he apparently knew there were federal agents in the audience kind of taking notes and watching him, and he went on with the speech anyway. So he seems to have, in a sense, wanted to get arrested. Uh, he certainly used it uh, to make, uh, you know, as a public platform to make a, a statement. Uh, in the court case, he actually uh, uh, talked, uh, said, yeah, I, I admit I oppose this war. I oppose all war. Uh, I find war uh, abhorrent. So D Debs used this to sort of have a public platform uh, to continue to speak out against the war, at least until he got thrown into the slammer. Uh, but uh, just after the war ended, I mean, the, the case was concluded after, but uh, as the next president after Wilson, Warren Harding, uh, a conservative Republican, takes office, uh, he actually uh, let him out of prison, uh, realizing this guy's not a criminal. Uh, you know, he just let let him go. The war's over anyway. Let it let him out. Next, we get to uh, part of over here uh, that uh, has to do with how America is going to uh, pay for uh, and supply its uh, uh, war effort when it gets uh, its troops a couple million, uh, as it were, uh, overseas. Uh, so uh, there needed to be a ramping up of military production and supplies and weapons. So uh, this brought uh, the wartime economy uh, about, which uh, meant in part new government agencies that would be temporary, but that were designed to, in a sense, force or lean on uh, American business and the private sector uh, to follow the uh, lead of the government, to do what the government wants uh, it to do, uh, and uh, kind of coordinate its economic activity uh, and produce things that the government wants them to produce. So the War Industries Board was headed by Bernard Baruch, who you see here, uh, a successful, extremely wealthy and well-known uh, financier uh, and banker on Wall Street. He became the head of the board, which was a, a clever appointment because the big capitalists, owners of big companies and you know major industries like steel and otherwise, they're more likely to go along with this uh, and not try to fight it and push back if it's a uh, fellow capitalists and a respected and you know uh, you know well known one at that than if they had put someone like say Eugene V. Debs. Uh, a noted opponent of capitalism, uh, not that they ever would have, but I think you get the point. Uh, Baruch uh, made it m much easier. And he didn't have to even lean too heavily on businesses because it, it was kind of like delivering a message with a, you know, uh, of, uh, uh, in a velvet glove with an you know, iron fist underneath. Uh, he could sort of smile and ask them politely. Uh, we, you know, the government would like it if you you know, for the time being, suspended your production of this and started producing this for the war effort. Uh, and, and he would appeal to their patriotism and uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
but most businesses complied, and again, politely on both sides, Bar Baruch requesting politely, them responding politely with a yes, because they knew things could get rough and tough, and they'd probably lose against the federal government if they resisted. So the agency was started in 1917. It coordinated the purchase of war supplies, set industry production quotas, push companies to be more efficient, eliminate waste. So this happens a lot in modern warfare, especially in big wars. World wars, of course, are big ones. Uh, it's not just the United States. The other countries in this war and the next world war uh, did the same thing. And that is normally capitalist economies in wartime get altered somewhat. Uh, not that all aspects of capitalism are gone. They certainly weren't here. Profits are still flowing uh, into the pockets of the owners uh, and CEOs and investors uh, in these companies. Uh, but the government does start to take more of an active role than it does in peacetime. It's always meant to be temporary, uh, and it certainly was here. But nonetheless, uh, this is uh, unprecedented in a capitalist society. But wartime emergencies are seen as just that, emergencies. And it's believed that, uh, I guess the, the major philosophy behind this, we could say, uh, anywhere, is that normally capitalist economies exist through the law and, and, and sort of you know, work day to day uh, by adhering to laws of supply and demand and competition, which aren't necessarily predictable. And unpredictability, uh, right, uh, instability in markets is not preferable to governments in wartime because it could hurt the war effort. So the government steps in in these kind of situations to try to take a more active role to make the economy more predictable because they're calling the shots and not letting, again, free market uh, operations and principles as much uh, dictate the economy. So this is the, the, the idea behind it. Another government agency that was formed uh, to do something similar, uh, take sort of more control uh, of the economy in American society uh, for the benefit of the war effort and you know, believed uh, that the whole society needed to be behind the war effort was the Food Administration. And I'm just picking out a couple. There were other agencies too. This one, uh, 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 the president uh, picked Herbert Hoover, a rising star uh, in American politics and business, uh, to run the administration. Uh, Herbert Hoover, early in the war, showed himself to be uh, extremely good at through, uh, the private sector, not government, uh, at raising funds uh, from usually private uh, enterprise, uh, churches and businesses, to uh, donate money to help uh, people that have lost their homes and, you know, had their lives damaged in war-torn Europe, innocent civilians, places like Belgium, things like that. And he was so successful at it, uh, and uh, it drew so much attention that uh, this uh, you know, is what led to President Wilson appointing him as head of the Food Administration. And as we'll see, his career uh, uh, takes off even more uh, after this. Uh, and he did a, a, a masterful job uh, overall in running this administration. But the idea behind this was that since the war is such a huge economic commitment and a gi giant commitment of resources, uh, Americans need to cut back uh, on food and other things, uh, other resources, so that there's more left over or enough left over uh, to supply uh, the troops at the front uh, across uh, in, in France. Uh, and there was an ad uh, kind of PR campaign uh, for this as well. Uh, meatless Mondays, uh, wheatless Wednesdays, using alliteration to remind people that like one day a week, uh, don't eat uh, uh, wheat. Uh, one day a week, don't eat meat. And this wasn't, you know, this wasn't so uh, oppressive that if you didn't do it, you know, the cops are going to knock down your door and drag you out uh, and throw you in a dungeon somewhere. Uh, but there was, uh, you know, a certain amount of pressure kind of a patriotic pressure, again, guilting people into it. So there was a, a propaganda PR element uh, to the Food Administration as well. As far as over there is concerned, now we get to the Great War in Europe, and we're only going to focus on one of many theaters uh, or fronts in this war, the Western Front, 
because this is the only uh, place uh, the United States sent troops and, and fought. It is the uh, uh, front in the war that Americans, partly because of that, uh, uh, even now learn the most about, tend to be uh, most fascinated with. The trench warfare that we'll see here, uh, the, which didn't exist, at least to that degree, uh, dominated the way the war was fought on the Western Front, is particularly uh, fascinating to people uh, uh, for various reasons. The causes of the war, uh, we're just going to go through quickly. I teach Western civilization and do a whole unit on this, so I spend much more time in that class on the causes of the war. But here, since it's American history, we just need a smattering uh, of knowledge. The, the spark that brought the war was the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal to us today. But keep in mind that at the time, Austria, or Austria-Hungary it was known by then, was one of the five great powers of Europe, which means it was one of the most powerful countries in the world. And Franz Ferdinand, as Archduke, uh, was the heir to the throne, uh, meaning his dad was the emperor of the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, and when daddy died, uh, he was going to be uh, the next emperor. So he was a big-time uh, uh, political leader in Europe. He was assassinated uh, in the uh, late spring, early summer of 1914 by Serbian terrorists. The Serbs, who already had their own independent country, but who also had uh, millions of their uh, fellow Serbians living uh, outside of their own country, uh, many of them under the uh, uh, power uh, of the uh, uh, this empire, Austro-Hungarian. And so uh, there was a nationalist movement amongst Serbians and uh, fellow uh, southern Slavs to force Austria sort of out of the area uh, uh, so that they, uh, Serbia could basically enlarge and uh, place its borders around all Serbian peoples. And some of those, uh, a minority uh, of Serbian nationalists, were so enraged about Austrian uh, uh, policy that they formed uh, opposition groups and in some cases terrorist groups. So it was a Serbian terrorist group that mastermind, although it wasn't brilliant by any means, they almost ended up accidentally killing him, but they did successfully assassinate uh, the Archduke uh, in Sarajevo in 1914 uh, after bungling it. Uh, they bungled the operation and ended up killing him anyway. Uh, but uh, this ended up being the spark, not a long-term cause, uh, but it's this that set off kind of a chain reaction that uh, five weeks later led to war after a great deal of uh, attempts by the various European countries involved, or even not involved, uh, to negotiate a settlement, a peaceful settlement, but it didn't work in the end, partly through some of their own failings, leaders' uh, failure to see things uh, accurately, to make wrong turns and you know, bad mistakes. Uh, so it's possible this war could have been avoided uh, had leaders not made so many crucial mistakes uh, at the wrong times. The fuel uh, means kind of the long-term uh, uh, causes of the war. Rising nationalism all over Europe, and uh, really in the world uh, by this time, uh, helped to contribute. Remember, the Serbians, uh, uh, right, assassination of the Archduke was based on nationalism, sort of a rising tide of sort of this uh, Serbian uh, uh, pride and unity uh, of the Serbian people. Uh, so uh, that's one way in which nationalism played a role. But in a, a much broader sense, nationalism uh, affected all the European countries so much. Uh, Germany, Great Britain, France, Russia, you know, the major combatants in the war, and all the others, that the, the populations were so uh, proud of their country at this time, nationalism was in full swing, uh, so uh, uh, willing to think uh, you know, our country is unique and in some cases superior, so it can lead to arrogance and you know, nationalism can have scary uh, properties to it as well. But nationalism was so, was so widespread that famously when the war broke out, in August of 1914, all the countries started to declare war on each other. There were like these huge, like tailgate parties, these huge celebrations in the capitals, Berlin and London and Paris uh, and beyond. People are, you know, celebrating, uh, they're excited and elated 
that war has come, uh, which is a bit bizarre. But it's partly because uh, there was this nationalistic fervor in every country. So how is that a cause? Well, it made the war easier to prosecute from governments because they didn't have pushback from the public. The public was totally on board, uh, right? So, which wasn't true in the United States, as we've seen. Uh, that had to be manufactured. Uh, but nationalism been around for long enough now. It had been somewhat manufactured, but much uh, long before uh, this. So this is basically, by this time, an, a natural reaction from publics uh, in one country after another. Imperialism is another cause, and I'm not exhausting all the causes by any means, uh, but the European countries, uh, like the United States, uh, we know by this time, had colonies, uh, uh, empires uh, around the world, and there were lots of rivalries. Uh, uh, the Anglo-German competition for power, one of them, uh, which included a, a naval arms race between the two, building uh, more bigger, more high-tech battleships to try to counter and outdo the other uh, other one, which uh, helped lead to so much mistrust between these two countries and their allies that that's sort of a cause of the war as well. But these countries have so many empires around the world that it, it led to, I think, greater touchiness uh, amongst the European powers because there were more flashpoints. So France and Germany, for instance, share uh, a border. Right, for part, at least part of their uh, uh, you know, territory touches on each other. But if they just have one place uh, where there's a border, okay, there's one flashpoint. But, and I'm exaggerating here to make the point, let's say that France and Germany uh, have colonies around the world and there are 10 places outside of Europe where they have colonies that border each other. Well, that now gives them 11 flashpoints. So at any one of those 11 flashpoints, if some sort of uh, you know incident happens uh, that pits the two against each other, there's a possible major conflict uh, you know, sort of waiting to happen. So imperialism kind of intensifies mistrust uh, and uh, increases the possibility that something could go wrong between uh, uh, you know, two or more European countries. Also of importance in explaining how the war came about, causes of the war, uh, was the fact that by 1914 there were two rival blocks of alliances. Uh, not every country in Europe was in one or the other, but uh, the important ones, powerful ones were, uh, and most of the countries were. So with two camps of rivalry, uh, that sets up a potentially uh, you know, dangerous situation because it means, and this is the way it happened, if two countries go to war with each other through their treaty uh, uh, entanglements, uh, through their treaty obligations and their alliances, it's likely to pull other countries uh, involved uh, uh, into the war and get them involved because of their commitments under alliances. And this is exactly what happened. So at first, this was a seemingly a conflict between Austria-Hungary and Serbia, uh, whose uh, terrorist group uh, assassinated a high official uh, in the uh, Austrian government. But because of the treaty uh, obligations and alliances, the other sides uh, get pulled, the other countries get pulled in as well. Why would they do that when it wasn't, let's say, Germany and France and Great Britain, when it wasn't about them at first? Well, they have the treaty obligations, but I guess what I'm asking is, why wouldn't they just say, you know what, I know we signed a treaty of alliance with you, but this doesn't make sense. Why should we fight in this war? Well, part of the reason is countries that make those kind of commitments, right, do them because there's mutual support. And if you might need your allies' support in a future war. That's why you ally with them in the first place. If you don't follow through and they need help, they're certainly not going to follow through and you need help. So uh, countries do tend to, uh, uh, you know, adhere to their alliance commitments. They don't always. Uh, in this case, they, they, they all did, which uh, led to a much bigger uh, and more violent war. Trench warfare, again, the 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 main feature uh, of warfare that was different uh, from the other uh, fronts, Russian front, Italian front, etc., uh, in this war. And trench warfare was horrific, uh, and uh, it, it's hard to imagine someone being involved in this, but that's partly what makes it so fascinating, I think, to so many people. Why trench warfare? Because when 
German forces invaded France uh, in the fall of 1914. They were trying to take Paris and knock France out of the war quickly, but they only got a certain way into France before the French uh, and their British allies sent troops, uh, so the French and the British are fighting you know, shoulder to shoulder, uh, stopped them, uh, but the French and the British couldn't push the Germans out. So a stalemate developed where both sides couldn't move the other side backwards, so they dug in. Uh, by the end of 1914, there were about 600 miles of trenches stretching uh, from the English Channel to neutral Switzerland. This honeycomb of, uh, of, of trenches on both, both sides. Uh, and this allowed for just uh, enormous uh, uh, bloodshed and carnage uh, and uh, uh, you know just hardship in multiple ways for soldiers. If you were in one of these trenches, uh, the chances that you weren't going to make it back alive to your home were, were, were strong. And this is what Americans are signing up for um, by 1917 and actually getting involved in by 1918. This is also part of industrialized or total war. Uh, and one way we could, total war means uh, many things, but in part it means that in a total war, it's such a big commitment that everyone in the country is enlisted in one way or another. So even in the United States, we've already seen this is kind of a total war because once the U.S. gets involved, the country is expecting them, the government is expecting them to conserve food, expecting them to buy liberty bonds, workers have to go to you know, work to make uh, weapons. Uh, so the whole country is mobilized. Not all of them are in the military, but they're all mobilized and playing some role in supporting the war effort. A total war. Industrialized, uh, uh, right? This is this is post-industrial revolution, uh, and the point here is that there's no way that these countries could have sat in the same trenches for four straight years and fired shells and machine guns at each other, basically in the same place for this long, killing millions of people, without industrialization. Why? Well, partly just the food. Uh, in previous centuries, before the Industrial Revolution, say, go back two centuries before this, there's no way armies could have stayed for four years in this part of France and, and, and fired at each other uh, without leaving because they would have eaten all the food too quickly in the area and they would have had to move to some other part of the country. Uh, so military forces had to move around much of the time before the Industrial Revolution uh, in order to eat. Uh, but because of industrialization, uh, these poor British soldiers who you see here uh, and their counterparts uh, on the other side uh, could just sit in the same place because they'd have canned goods shipped in and you know all th on trucks, planes and trucks and uh, boats and trucks in those days. So uh, the industrialization, uh, the process of industrialization, uh, allowed uh, this kind of carnage to take place in one place without really moving for four straight years. So once President Wilson decides the country must go to war and you know, convinces enough Americans uh, through the propaganda blitz, they began to organize the expeditionary force uh, under John Black Jack Pershing. Not very well known today, but uh, arguably one of the greatest generals in, in American history who led uh, two million troops, at least at the height of American forces involvement there, the U.S. lost 120,000, killed uh, uh, about twice that many wounded, uh, and uh, um, you know, uh, thousands of prisoners of war uh, and people missing in action. Uh, the Americans were, of course, brand new to trench warfare, so they were somewhat green, but that appears to have helped them in certain ways. German soldiers famously became somewhat uh, afraid of Americans. They thought Americans were like crazy killers. Uh, because they were so aggressive. Uh, but that might have been, uh, and be, was mainly out of a sense of naivete. Uh, not that Americans, you know, aren't as brave as anybody else and vice versa, but th the point is that the three, four years into the war, the Germans, the French, the British, the Russians were all wary of this type of warfare, and so they knew, you know, where they could take chances and where they had to be careful and cautious because it's such a dangerous type of warfare, 
but the Americans who were totally green just sort of rushed into it uh, and threw themselves aggressively into it uh, and sort of shocked uh, the Europeans, especially those on the other side, uh, with their uh, sort of brazen, uh, reckless aggressiveness. So it put the Germans on, the, on their heels. And it was American forces that turned the tide of war uh, that ended up uh, bringing a victory uh, 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 over Germany. Germany lost because the United States entered the war. But it's not primarily because of what I just said about the way the Americans fought, though that's you know certainly in there. It's primarily uh, something simpler than that uh, and much bigger than that. And that is the United States is the number one economy in the world, uh, right, with a large population sending 2 million troops and all the weapons and supplies was just overwhelming. So one side in this uh, uh, you know, drawn-out war uh, gets a fresh infusion of 2 million troops that hadn't been there before uh, and, uh, from the number one economy uh, in the world uh, with all of its technology and all the goods and uh, equipment it sends. Uh, and the other side, the Germans get none of that. There is no other country uh, that can do this, uh, and uh, the United States is on one side. So it's because of mainly because of American economic prowess on the other side of the Industrial Revolution that the United States uh, turns the tide of war in favor of the Allies, Amer the Americans were this time Britain and France, against the Germans and Austrians. After the war ends, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, goes across the Atlantic to Paris uh, to participate in the uh, gigantic Paris peace conference in that city lasted for about six months, off and on a bit. Woodrow Wilson is the first was the first president in American history to leave the country while in office. Now it's pretty common because a president can get on a plane and come back in you know, a couple of days. But keep in mind, it had to be done by ship then. So he had to be gone for at least several weeks or a couple of months and end up being uh, more than that uh, in, in the end. Uh, and the peace conference itself had a number of uh, outcomes, a number of different uh, uh, projects, so to speak, that it was working on. But the most important uh, development that came out of the peace talks and conference uh, was the Treaty of Versailles, the disastrous Treaty of Versailles. The, lo the losing powers, the losing countries, which included Germany, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, uh, and, and some others, they all signed surrender treaties uh, and had to accept the terms that were imposed upon them, but uh, each country signed a separate treaty. Uh, and since Germany was the most important and powerful of the losing powers, the most important treaty to come out of the Paris Peace Conference was the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, so, uh, But this conference dealt with all kinds of things, uh, and its uh, four most powerful leaders were uh, the leaders of uh, Great Britain, France, and Italy, and the U.S., of course, who was President Wilson on the extreme right there. Uh, these are the big four, as they're sometimes called. Uh, but this was a conference where basically the whole world attended, and the idea was uh, how are we going to put the world back together again after it had you know, been ravaged uh, by uh, this uh, uh, you know, world war. Remember that Wilson has a lot of ideas about what uh, should be done. So Wilsonian idealism uh, uh, certainly plays a huge role in this. By this time, Wilson was famous or well-known for uh, using idealistic phrases uh, about what uh, you know what this war represents. He called it a war to end all wars, uh, which shouldn't surprise us because remember he believes that the reason this war needed to be fought by Americans and everyone else was so that the United States could uh, you know have a seat at the negotiating table, which it now has, uh, and then create uh, a system uh, of world peace with certain rules that maintained world peace uh, and that would do so you know, indefinitely, if not forever. Uh, he talked about this war also while it was still going on. Phrases are still kind of around, even you know, just after the war ends, uh, that this war was going to make the world safe for democracy. So he believed that, uh, again, America's role was uh, to help prop Europe back up again uh, and to uh, uh, make it uh, more democratic. There had been democracies in Europe before, but Wilson believed that 
the 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 war itself showed that those democracies be, had become uh, decrepit uh, and worn down and needed a shot of American democracy uh, on American idealism and know-how behind democratic principles to make it work. Again, kind of the crusading uh, zeal uh, of this president, his self-righteousness in assuming that the America, you know, we Americans know best. We do democracy better than anybody else, so I'm here to help save the day. He also talked about a peace without victors, uh, which was really controversial. Uh, what he means is that it sh we shouldn't worry so much about who won and lost at this point. Uh, we need to set up a, a, a system, a world system of you know international relations uh, uh, to prevent wars like this from happening again. But if we do it the old-fashioned way, where the victors punish the vanquished, we're just going to have an ongoing cycle of wars. Because uh, if Germany uh, right is punished... Uh, as you know, the major uh, uh, losing uh, uh, side in this war, they're just going to be bitter uh, and hold re you know, resentment until they have a chance to turn the tide, and then they're going to start another war uh, at some point, and it'll just keep going back and forth like a blood feud, uh, you know, for uh, you know uh, an endless, uh, you know, potentially amount of time. So uh, Wilson is trying to end all that, but it was going to be easier said than done. It was one thing for the President of the United States to come skipping across the Atlantic Ocean uh, saying, hey, let's not worry about who won and lost. we got to think, you know, bigger than that uh, and set something up uh, that doesn't anger Germany uh, too much uh, so we can uh, set up a peaceful world system. The reason it was easier for him is because the United States wasn't damaged by the war at all. None of the war was fought in the United States, so Americans uh, weren't affected in that sense. And the United States didn't get into the war till the very end, so at least relatively speaking, uh, it took light uh, uh, casualties. Over 100,000 killed doesn't sound light, but keep in mind, uh, just to take France, the French lost about 2 million troops killed uh, in this war. So Wilson seemed impervious to the notion that, uh, that maybe the Europeans aren't going to like the idea of not punishing Germany uh, because they suffered uh, and died, uh, right, in such uh, uh, you know uh, huge numbers, uh, you know, to, to to win this war over Germany. Stephen Knott, who I've quoted already, his great book uh, on the uh, presidency and its history, said Wilson's oversized assessment of the potential of the American presidency was exceeded to only by his oversized ego. Wilson's conception of himself was little short of messianic. Messianic means he believed he was like a messiah, uh, said one eminent historian. Wilson's self-identification as a savior was evident in his frequent public pronouncements elevating every issue to a matter of deep moral import. French President Clemenceau, an ally, said of Wilson, quote, he thinks he is another Jesus Christ come upon earth to reform men. So even his own big four allies you see pictured here were quickly annoyed by the audacity of the American president uh, to uh, sort of you know, assume that he's kind of like walking on water and he's the one everyone should listen to because uh, he uh, is the, the, the most, uh, the wisest leader. Uh, uh, and he presents himself this way uh, very much to a fault. So the disastrous Treaty of Versailles, again, the most important outcome uh, of this uh, lengthy uh, period of peace talks in and around Paris, uh, in the end combined Wilson's idealism with the European countries, mainly Britain and France, concern for a more realistic uh, outcome uh, and a certain amount of vengeance. They wanted revenge. Uh, that's not to say that Germany was uh, necessarily at fault for this war. There's plenty of blame to go around. Historians all believe that every country involved in World War I bears some uh, share of the blame. Now, it's true that most of them think that Germany bears a larger share of the blame than any of the other countries, but none of them think that Germany deserves all of the blame. And keep in mind, this is pre-Nazi Germany. Hitler fought as a young man in World War I, but he was just a corporal in the trenches, not even an officer. And nobody knew who was going to be, uh, I mean, he was a nobody. Nobody knew who was going to be a, a world leader at some point. So this is before the Nazis. So uh, sometimes if you say, well, the you know, historians think the Germans were most responsible for World War I. Yeah, 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 Nazis. 
No, this is this is not a, a Nazi Germany. Nothing like it at all. So uh, for uh, the British and the French uh, to want to punish uh, the Germans, a sense of you know, revenge and vengeance was understandable, uh, uh, even if you know it wasn't entirely Germany's fault. France lost again two million of its young men in combat. Its public is not going to think anything but that Germany is the villain here. Wilson could more easily think of it another way because America didn't suffer as badly. Uh, Wilson only got really one theory that he wanted, or one uh, part of his 14 points out of this, and that's what you see at the bottom of the screen, his League of Nations, which was his most important idea. That was the linchpin of the whole 14 points. He got that into the treaty, so the, the, his fellow big four allies agreed to that, uh, but what Wilson had to uh, uh, cave into, which you know he didn't want to because of his uh, overall views on this, were huge reparations payments that Germany was forced to pay over a long period of time, uh, imposed limits on German industrial and military production over a long period of time, uh, the war guilt clause, Article 231 of the Treaty of Versailles, which said in legalese language, uh, more or less, we, Germany, agree that the war is our fault, and they were forced to sign it. You can see a drawing of the signing ceremony here. Uh, forced to sign it, because not because they agreed with it, but because they were... You know, kind of dead in the water. What, what else? What else can we do? We're basically they're basically, or they might as well be pointing a gun to our heads and saying, "Sign this document that you know admits that you're at fault." So the German leaders did because they really had no choice. Uh, but uh, this brought about the kind of uh, bitterness and anger in Germany that was what Wilson was trying to stay away from, especially the War Guilt Clause. The ink wasn't even dry on the Treaty of Versailles yet. Uh, before almost all Germans were deeply embittered and maybe permanently embittered over this uh, uh, treaty. They lost the war, but Germans didn't think it was their fault. And we, we've seen it wasn't entirely their fault uh, anyway. Uh, but it's the combination that the fact that this treaty, in a sense, was a compromise between the other Europeans on the winning side who wanted uh, something more along the lines of a tough uh, peace treaty uh, tough against Germany, and Wilson that won an I idealistic one that didn't want it to be tough on Germany uh, in order to think about long-term world peace, that in a sense watered it down. Uh, you might be able to argue that if it had been sort of all one way or all the other, all punishment uh, holding Germany down or all uh, you know, uh, idealism and sort of not keeping Germany down and trying to create uh, a peaceful world, you know, try to keep Germany from being bitter, that the treaty could have worked. Uh, but since it was not all of one or the other, uh, each one of those sides uh, was weaker than it could have otherwise been. Uh, in the long run, this treaty uh, and its defects uh, helped set the table uh, for World War II. Uh, that's how disastrous it actually was in the end which we'll come back to uh, when we get to World War II. Wilson, as a politician, uh, as well as uh, many other things we've seen, uh, raises a lot of questions uh, in terms of his ability. Uh, he was certainly a bright guy, professor at Princeton, uh, before becoming president. But when he left for Europe, for France, in 1919, he already knew that First of all, I mean, of course he knew this as a scholar and an American, uh, that for a treaty uh, to be, uh, you know, uh, law in the United States, it had to be negotiated by the executive branch and the president, but then ratified by the United States Senate. That's in our Constitution, right, from 1787. So uh, he already knew that. Furthermore, when he left, he already knew, he, he could count, that the United States Senate that needed to ratify his treaty uh, that he was going to come back with was in the hands uh, of Republicans. Uh, the majority of senators were Republicans. And even on top of that, the Senate majority leader was the Republican. We've already met Theodore Roosevelt's buddy, Henry Cabot Lodge, who we know is an internationalist and kind of a 
gung-ho supporter of a, an aggressive foreign policy, but he detested Woodrow Wilson, uh, and Wilson knew that. Uh, he said at one point, I never thought I could hate a man as much as I do Woodrow Wilson. So he comes back from France uh, after making no attempt to appease the Republicans uh, when he went there. For instance, he didn't bring, you know, it wasn't just Woodrow Wilson. He brought a whole team of lawyers and bureaucrats and accountants and uh, you know, politicians al along with him. Uh, uh, hundreds of them. Uh, every country did. It's a gigantic conference. Uh, a lot of details to be worked out. He didn't invite one prominent Republican leader to go, even though he knew he was going to have to sell this in the Republican-controlled United States Senate. Even if he had just appointed one big-name Republican to go uh, and give him a you know an important-sounding title at the conference, and then send him to I don't know the uh, French Riviera uh, to, uh, you know, just uh, party, uh, it would have still possibly ingratiated him with the Republicans to some degree. But he seemed to see no need uh, to kind of try to smooth over uh, possible Republican opposition ahead of time, nor did he see any need to do it uh, after he got back with the treaty in hand, which he now had to try to get the Senate to ratify. Probably because he was so arrogant and full of himself that he thought, they're not going to dare oppose me, even though they're Republicans and they have the majority of the Senate. Of course they're going to support me. I'm Woodrow Wilson. Or he just was, you know, uh, not uh, as keen a politician as he sometimes uh, you know, was made out to be or thought to be at the time. Uh, when he started to uh, realize that this thing might actually go down, uh, that the, the, the treaty might not be ratified by the Senate, he went on a whistle-stop tour of the United States by train. That's what a whistle-stop tour means. You see a photograph of him uh, departing a train here. Uh, and essentially tried to go around the Congress, or over the heads of Congress, straight to the American public, making speeches every stop. Uh, he went through, I forget how many states, but a lot in a whirlwind tour. Uh, and uh, remember that Wilson, a believer in strong executive authority, uh, uh, believe that the Congress should be as much as possible kind of cut out of the loop and the presidents uh, uh, would need to go straight to the public and use massive public support uh, to, you know, to give the president leverage, supposedly on behalf of the public, uh, over Congress and other uh, elements uh, of government. So that's exactly what he's doing here. So this fits to a T his overall philosophy of the presidency, though I'm sure he wasn't necessarily thinking about that too much at this time, but that's what he was doing. Uh, and uh, and it, it did show some signs of working, that the public uh, did seem to be uh, on his side increasingly as this happened. Uh, but he wasn't, he was not going to compromise with the Republicans at all. Uh, he said, I'm not the kind that considers compromises when I once take my position. Saying, okay, I've already negotiated the treaty, this is the way it is, if you don't like it, too bad, you're going to vote for it. And Henry Cabot Lodge says, no, we're not. Uh, Wilson probably could have got this through, probably, uh, if he would have been willing to compromise and change some of the wording of the treaty uh, uh, to uh, the satisfaction of the Republicans and Lodge. The biggest issue you see on the screen here uh, was fears that the treaty would get in the way of U.S. sovereignty. What does that mean? U S power, uh, so that, uh, mostly Republicans feared that this treaty would take away decision-making power about what's in America's best interest in the future to the league of nations, to a European or world, uh, uh you know, body, uh, and it would then, uh, put America, uh, in a, a sort of a less, the American government, uh, in a less powerful position when it dealt with world issues. Uh, and uh, they were extremely wary of this possibility. So had Wilson been willing to concede uh, and change the sort of strength uh, uh, of, uh, or, or, or uh, make sure that there are reassurances in the treaty that bolstered American sovereignty vis-a-vis uh, -vis the League of Nations, he might have been able to sell this. But he made no attempt because as you see at the bottom, uh, the, the quote, he meant that, uh, and he was that stubborn uh, of a guy, uh, that confident in himself, I, I would say that arrogant, 
uh, that he didn't think he needed to compromise. Uh, to make matters worse for him, he had been working so hard uh, for months in Paris, and now uh, he was getting up there in years, and now makes this uh, tour by train where he's you know constantly making speeches after you know clearly being exhausted from all those months away, working the entire time. He had a stroke uh, uh, in one uh, location, I forget where, and then he had a second stroke, a massive one, that forced him to be brought back to Washington, D.C., and from that point forward, the rest of his presidency, he was really unable to lead. Uh, he was mentally still there, though I think uh, you know his speech pattern was slower, uh, but he physically uh, was uh, 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 couldn't really get around. Uh, and the presidency is a more physical job than it sometimes may seem. Uh, I mean, it's mostly a mental job, but if you can't move, uh, it's hard to sort of carry out all the responsibilities of president. So uh, this whole thing broke him. It's tragic because he, it, it, to some degree, his uh, the intensity with which he pursued this project, his 14 points, League of Nations, you know, uh, his plan for world peace, was uh, his view of his own legacy. I'm thinking, I'm going to go down as a, a hero, one of the biggest heroes in history, because I'll be the guy that figured out how to bring peace to the world for the first time ever. And now uh, all that is he's going up in flames. Though it's a lot of it is his own fault, his own stubbornness, his own arrogance. Nonetheless, uh, he's still, uh, right, this is still tragic. Uh, and sure enough, in the end, because he wouldn't compromise, uh, the United States Senate rejected uh, by majority vote the Treaty of Versailles. And ironically then, the United States, uh, uh, right, uh, whose president was the guy that created the idea of a League of Nations, was the one country that didn't participate in it uh, because of the events that we just mentioned. As far as the consequences of the war are concerned, uh, it made the U.S. unquestionably the most powerful economy and really country uh, in, in the world going forward. It left Europe dangerously unstable, partly because the United States did sort of remove its influence. So the internationalists got their way by, you know, getting America fully involved in the world war. But afterwards, America snapped back to its default position of isolationism and didn't keep itself insinuated in European politics. And since we know that Hitler came to power, we're going to get to that soon enough, in Europe, it's a, a, a legitimate question to ask if the United States would have stayed committed uh, uh, in Europe after World War One, maybe even kept troops stationed there uh, and watched over, uh, you know, Germany under the Treaty of Versailles provisions, would Hitler have been able to come to power or come to power and do what he did? We don't know the answer to that because it didn't happen, but it's possible the United States could have. Uh, you know, help to lead to a different outcome than the horrific one that we got that we know as World War II and the Holocaust. The war basically killed off the progressive movement, which we'll save because we'll get to it in the next unit on the 1920s. Uh, though it may have pushed, pushed some progressive goals uh, sort of further along uh, for the future because the progressives did like some of these programs, albeit temporary, like the Food Administration, because remember the pro progressives love the idea of federal government programs, social programs to help sort of the American public and different groups uh, in need, and so they thought some of these programs, you know, that are temporary, uh, right, to making them permanent uh, might be a good idea. Just the overall uh, way in which the Wilson administration had handled this war uh, with the government being very hands-on as opposed to hands-off, appealed to progressive sensibilities. Thank you.